Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we're going to let a few people trickle in here. My name is Daniel Moyer. I'm one of the sales support trainers here at Simplify Power Briggs & Stratton. I also have on the line with me today is Nathan Heston, uh, one of the other uh, training and tech support managers here at Simplify Power Briggs & Stratton. And what we have today for you is harsh environment trainings. Uh, it's, it's particular apt for today, uh, considering it's uh, what's well, still January. And um, one thing I really realize, I realize is that as these energy storage systems start to become more popular throughout the country, we're gonna start to see a lot more of these uh, battery energy storage systems being installed in really cold environments, particularly in the Northeast, um, other parts of the country like Illinois, Minnesota. Um, so I think that we're going to see this coming up more common. Also, I think what we're going to see more common is uh, energy storage systems being installed outside. Um, certain jurisdictions have um, become more strict on allowing battery energy storage systems to be installed in garages and basements. So we're going to be putting these outside. Um, before we get started, a couple things. Um, what we need to do is a little housekeeping. This is a NABCEP accredited course. So we're gonna go ahead and give you some uh, credit. Uh, at the end of this presentation, there's going to be, an, my email is gonna pop up. Go ahead and uh, enter in your name, uh, your full name. Please spell it out for me so I know exactly how to put it on your NABCEP certificate. That way we can send you out your credits, your continuing education certificate and get your NABCEP credits. The second thing I wanna mention is that we, can't uh, I can't um, put down your hand or, or don't raise your hand. If you got a question or a comment, please go ahead and pop it into the Q and A chat. I see somebody already had um, put in a, a question here. Um, Fernando, thank you. Fernando was asking about hot and humid. That actually is going to be addressed on uh, this talk. And I do realize there, if I were to be doing this presentation in summer, uh, I would probably be uh, uh, mentioning that here at the very beginning. And uh, so one thing I, I like to do, and um, I think it's always fun, is let's go ahead and put in our chat. If you put in your chat, this is going to be the honor system, what is the forecasted temperature for today? And you can put it in as Fahrenheit or centigrade, but what's your forecasted low temperature for today? Whoever gets the coldest temperature uh, we'll go ahead and send out a hat or a t-shirt or something like that. Um, and I'm also excited maybe to say whoever has the warmest temperature today, if we have anybody from uh, Latin America, I, I imagine they're going to win. So go ahead in the chat now, pop in what your forecasted low temperature, whoever has the coldest low forecasted temperature for today, uh, we'll send a hat and whoever has the warmest uh, low temperature, if that makes sense, um, we'll see if we can send out another uh, hat. Maybe whoever's coldest is going to get a sweater. Whoever's warmest is um, going to get a, uh, a hat. How about that? Um, Nathan, did you have, uh, you want to introduce yourself really quick or, or have anything to say here yeah. at the beginning? Well, just welcome everybody. And I uh, want to let you know that we're getting sunshine in Southern California here for the first time in a long time. So I'm not going to win any um, cold weather or hot weather <laughs> awards today, but I'm certainly pleased to see that we actually have, um, you know, getting a little less rain here. Um, so Welcome everyone. I'm looking forward to running this training together with Daniel today and thanks for your participation and I'll be answering some of the Q&A as as we go along as well. So go ahead yeah. take it away Daniel. Yeah, thank you Nathan. Yeah, stop me at any time if you see a good question that maybe pertains to what I'm talking about at that moment. Um, sorry about this. I realized as I was getting prepared for this talk this morning I should really have these in, in centigrade and in um, in Fahrenheit but any lithium ion battery shouldn't be um, charged below freezing. It is okay to leave it in a state of um, a, a stable state or just um, idle state. And it's okay to discharge them um, below freezing. But really what we wanna see is when you're charging a lithium ion battery, not just ours, but of any manufacturer, that you're not charging it below freezing. So 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero centigrade, up to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, which I think is around 43 degrees centigrade. 
That being said, if we have a battery sitting idle, maybe it's an off-grid cabin up in Maine and you're away for the, the winter and that bat the batteries are just sitting there, it is okay to have that little bit of a wider temperature range when it's sitting idle and when we're discharging the battery. So down to negative four Fahrenheit, which I did the math, uh, came down to negative 20 degrees centigrade. And we can get up to about 60 degrees centigrade with the upper limit on these operating temperatures. As I mentioned, when we're having a battery sitting idle, it can get a little bit colder. Now, the amount of time that you have that battery sitting idle, uh, the temperature range is a little bit more narrow. I, I mentioned it here. If you're going to have it sitting there for six months, maybe it's a, a cabin you're not making it to very often, we want to see that 14 degrees Fahrenheit up to 77 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the really what we want to see. If you're going to have it in a shorter period of time, uh, you're just leaving for a three months or so, we can have that a little bit um, wider range. So it's really nice when we're seeing that in these uh, off-grid cabins, especially we've had great success using our batteries on off-grid systems. I will mention, you know, our, um, our batteries pair well with a lot of other different manufacturers, whether it's your Morningstar, your Outback, your Schneiders, your SMAs, as long as you get in there and set the charging parameters and the discharging parameters like our low battery voltage cutouts, um, the bulk, the float voltages, we can pair our batteries with other people's equipments. Um, and that being said, I'm also excited to talk about our new uh, energy storage system or totally verticated energy storage system. And the reason I kind of bring all this up is that when we're having temperature considerations, we not only have to consider and altitude and humidity, uh, we're not only considering the, the battery, but we also have to think about some of the other components in the system, such as the inverter. Does the inverter have a temperature limit? Does the inverter uh, charger have a uh, um, an altitude limit? So when we're thinking about these, I'm gonna be focusing mainly on batteries today, but there's other parts and pieces in these systems that need to be considered as we're, um, uh, considering these uh, extreme environments. Daniel, would it be an okay time to jump in and just talk for a second about what's happening in these batteries? Yes, please um, do, Nathan. Thank you. I'm, I'm not going to go into detail just yet. We might talk a little bit when we talk about the cold range, but it, it's important to realize that, you know, all batteries have some type of temperature range. I remember when I was fairly young, and I had bought an extra battery for my vehicle, and the idea was to use this uh, lead acid battery um, as, a, as, as a power source. Um, now, we did get some pretty cold days in Pennsylvania back then. I was in northern Pennsylvania, and we, we got down to negative 30 Fahrenheit. My lead acid battery actually um, froze up and, and bulged the sides out of the battery, and the, the battery died. Right, a lead acid battery has an aqueous solution inside it. It means a water-based solution, right? It's got sulfuric acid inside there. And despite the fact that when you add salts, which is what an acid is, to, to water, the, the freezing temperature goes down, it still can freeze, right? Now, what's inside a, a lithium battery is not an aqueous solution. It's actually an organic solution. And it doesn't have that bulging effect that water does when it, when it freezes, right? Water, is, water, when it freezes, can expand. And when it expands, it can destroy structural components, like the, the shape of the battery and, um, and, and push the plates apart, et cetera. So inside a lead acid battery, um, we have limitations based on you know, different reasoning. Inside a lithium cell, we actually have an organic solvent that contains the salts, the exchange salts. And the problem normally associated with low temperatures is actually the mobility of the lithium ions, right? So having low mobility of lithium ions, li lithium, right, can cause problems when you're trying to charge and discharge the battery. Um, everything basically slows down at low temperatures. On the hot side of things with a lithium battery, we have an organic, right? And, and organics end up um, creating a vapor pressure at hot temperatures. So if we get too hot, that organic solvent can actually create a higher vapor pressure and cause delamination um, of the cathode and an anode inside the cell. So completely different mechanisms of failure from a lead acid battery. And that's why the temperature considerations are different. In terms of just storage, which is what this slide is all about, 
right? When you're storing the battery and you're not trying to move the lithium ions from one side to another, um, the, you know, the storage temperatures, you can go to lower temperatures and without having major problems. At low temperatures, when you're trying to move ions, especially on the charging side, that's where you end up running into problems. So we can talk a little bit more about that later in the, later in the um, training today, uh, but I wanted to establish that here at the beginning. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. It's, it's great um, to understand kind of the chemistry behind it and um, not just understand the numbers, but why, why we're talking about this. Thank you. Um, we have uh, two types of uh, battery um, management systems in our batteries. We have a standard five batteries, our five 3.8 batteries, what you see here in the picture. Uh, it doesn't have an external communicating battery management systems. All of our batteries do have a battery management system. The Phi has an internal only battery management system. So it's not a closed loop communicating battery. And that's fine. A lot of pieces of equipment out there don't have the capability of communicating uh, with batteries through closed loop communication. So we designed this battery for those types of applications. We have another battery I'm going to show you here on the next slide. It's our Amplify battery. Amplify battery does have that closed loop communications, and I'm going to get into it a little bit, but with that closed loop communication, the Amplify battery can tell a piece of equipment its temperature. It can tell a piece of equipment to slow down its charge rate. So when we're talking about the Phi battery, which is the one you see here, and it's not any less uh, valuable or of high quality than the Amplify. It's just why buy something extra that you don't need um, when you're not able to use it. So the Phi battery here doesn't have an internal temperature um, control system through the battery management system. So what we're having to do is really rely on external pieces of equipment or heating pads or other types of warming devices to make sure we keep this battery in its proper operating temperature range. Being said, with the Amplify battery, the one that does have those closed loop communication capabilities, you can tell because it has these little um, uh, COM ports up here where your Cat5e or greater cables would go into, it can tell um, a piece of equipment that it's starting to get cold. Let's go ahead and ramp down our, my charge rate or, hey, it's too cold. Let's go ahead and stop charging. And then if for whatever reason, the piece of equipment is not listening to the commands of the battery, the internal battery management system inside this battery will open up. It'll, it has a contactor in there. It's going to open up circuit, prevent the battery from being charged. So there's kind of that two layers of protection. Um, and what we want to make sure is that you're using uh, those COM features on inverters that are supported uh, with our closed loop communication. Right now it's the um, Outback, um, I'm sorry, the Solark and the um, our new inverter. This is a great picture. I, I love I love this picture because look, I, one, it's a great pole mount look, uh, pole mount, and look how steep these uh, panels are tilted. Right, these are almost vertical. So what this is doing is is capturing some of that low. Uh, sun, right? In the winter, you can imagine the sun is just kind of barely skirting the, the horizon in this picture. And we got these panels all the way tilted up to capture that, um, that incidence of that sun. Um, and then we look in that back and we see that little shed in the background of this picture, right? And we want to, the, the point of this slide really here is to kind of understand that the temperature outside this, in this picture here, the ambient temperature, isn't necessarily what the temperature is inside that little cabin or that little power shack. The temperature inside that little power shack isn't necessarily the temperature that's inside maybe a battery cabinet or even internal in the battery. So batteries have an internal resistance and that resistance is dissipated as heat. So as we're charging um, and, and discharging these batteries, they create an internal heat. So when we are considering these temperatures, um, and I asked everybody to pop in the, the chat what their forecasted low or forecasted high temperature is, that's not necessarily temperature inside of a battery. So it's we're, I want to just make sure everyone understands that there's a gradient between inside a battery and the ambient temperature. And if we were to say activate a battery warmer uh, pad based on the uh, thermostatic control based on ambient temperatures, 
we'd probably turn that battery heater on before it's necessary. If we look at the internal battery, the temperature, and we're measuring the internal temperature through a thermostat, we're going to be turning on and cycling on a, a battery warmer at, at more appropriate times and wasting less uh, energy that it has to be generated through the solar. So that, that's really what we want to understand in this slide is, is there's a difference between these gradients um, and, and what can happen when you're not considering these cold temperatures, loss of capacity, uh, potential reduction if we're charged at a, uh, the C over two rate, which is the maximum charge and discharge rate of our batteries, uh, and really just reducing the cycle life of the battery. There, there's you, another thing that, um, that we don't mention here and we don't spend a lot of time talking about, but that's just also the capacity of the battery cells. When you discharge a battery at, at lower temperatures, you also get less energy out of it. So the, the standard capacity of our 3.8 kilowatt phis and amplifies and the 4.98 kilowatt simplify battery, those, those capacities are tested at 25 Celsius and at a uh, rate of C over five discharge. So it's important to keep in mind that if you're charging and discharging in low temperatures, you're not going to get quite as much energy out of those battery banks. So that's another reason for wanting to have batteries in a temperature controlled environment as well. Um, you'll, you'll get better performance at slightly elevated temperatures. Yeah, I'd be able to use all of that usable capacity. Exactly. Thank you. I mentioned it uh, kind of previously in the other slide is that the Amplify battery with those closed loop communications is able to transmit up to a piece of equipment that's able to listen to it and reduce the battery's charge rate. And you can see on that uh, kind of chart over here on the right, you can see that the, the gradient of how we're starting to slow down that charge rate. And at some point, point we're going to stop completely. Um, it should be noted that the Phi battery does not automatically uh, reduce that. That's the first battery I mentioned without that closed loop communication. So we really, we need to make sure we um, have those protections built into the piece of equipment. So we all uh, understand that insulating um, can help keep our homes warm. It can also help keep our uh, battery cabinets warm. If you imagine inside of that power shack that I showed you previously, there's that there's charge controllers in there, there's inverters in there. Um, those pieces of equipments are generating their own heat as well as the batteries. So if we can retain some of that heat and prevent heat from being lost through um, radiation, through conduction or through convection, right? We can trap some of that heat and then have to cycle heaters on a little bit less. We have battery cabinets. Um, the battery cabinets do not come insulated, but you can add insulation. And there's a couple of examples of what it can look like. Everyone's seen kind of the, the foam, the rigid foam board. Those can be usually one inch thick boards can be used to line the walls. Um, also what we can do is put insulation under the batteries. If we think of um, a big metal case, um, that big metal case can act as a heat sink. So we want to get some rigid insulation that's capable of supporting the weight of that battery. And that's going to prevent the um, heat dissipation through conduction through that big metal plate out of those batteries. Um, and I mentioned before, if there are other pieces of uh, electronics in there, you know, those are going to be generating heat and it's going to contribute to keeping batteries warm. Um, if you do have uh, vent fans, and we're going to talk about high temperature here in a little bit. I know somebody had asked that in the chat. Uh, we can cover up those um, those fan those vent holes to keep uh, heat trapped in there a little bit better. Temporary insulation can be added and taken off. Um, I've seen it done on the outside of battery cabinets as well, so we're not having to get in there. Um, but just keep in mind when we want to. Um, put things outside and I imagine, I'd hope that that power shack that we'd shown in a previous cabin, the power shack itself has also been insulated. So this is what those uh, battery heating pads look like. Uh, they're thermostatically controlled. Um, we have um, these available. One thing I wanna mention though, is if this is a situation where you know you're gonna be needing some battery heating pads, make sure you let us know ahead of time. Uh, make sure you let us uh, special order that. So what we do is we take one of those batteries and we actually take that 10K thermistor 
and we put it internal in the battery so that we're measuring the internal cell temperature of the battery. That way, we're again, we're only cycling on those heating pads when we need to, not uh, based on ambient temperatures. These uh, thermostatically controlled heating pads are uh, powered off of AC, low, uh, the AC side of things. So that allows us to maintain um, the low voltage battery disconnects um, that are usually uh, protections that are found on the inverter side of things. If we can't, for whatever reason, uh, have that thermos the thermistor built inside internally in the battery to measure cell, cell temperature, what we like to do is sandwich the, the sensor between two batteries so that if you imagine we can't get inside a battery, but we can sandwich them between two batteries, we're going to get as close as possible to that internal temperature. Um, you know, don't install the temperature sensor um, in, say, the lowest part of the cabinet near a back wall. That's going to cause these heating pads to cycle on and off uh, unnecessarily. If you don't use our built-in um, thermostatic um, heating um, thermostats, what we can use are third-party designs. And uh, I'm not, I don't work for Victron or get paid by Victron, but Victron makes a lot of great products. Um, and some of that, the one of the ones you see there on the bottom is the BMV 712. Um, that is a battery monitor and it can also be used to cycle on, um, 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 it can actually be used to curtail charge rates from a charge controller. So we're preventing a charge being pushed into a battery below a freezing temperature. Again, if you're going to put that little uh, sensor here, let's go ahead and try and sandwich it between um, batteries so that we're measuring that internal temperature. Nathan, did you have anything to add? Or? Oh, we'll keep going. Warm temperatures. This is a great picture. Um, this, I imagine, uh, is uh, it looks like it could be in Nevada um, or, or another Arizona or something like that. But hot temperatures can also lead to damage. Um, really, what we want to see is uh, a thermostat that can turn on fans or disconnect fans. If it's really um, extreme environments, we can also see uh, active uh, cooling systems like a mini split system or other devices. I don't have a slide here, but we do offer high voltage lines where essentially if you pour um, a concrete pad, we can come out and drop a 20 foot or a 40 foot container. Um, you know, these are large microgrid scaled up systems but inside of those containers are systems that have um, active cooling system, mini splits, um, air conditionings or heaters as well. Uh, Nathan, do you want to maybe explain what, what happens inside a lithium cell when it gets really hot? Yeah, sure. And sorry, I couldn't answer you there a second ago. I was That's trying to unmute myself and it took too long. I know. Um, and I, I kept talking. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Well, what's hap what is inside of a cylindrical lithium cell, and really all lithium cells, is kind of this, uh, what we call a jelly roll. It's a sandwich um, of kind of cathode and anode, which are where the exchange of the lithium happens. Um, it's a sandwich on the outside having those cathode and anodes, and on the inside having that organic solvent with a separator layer to prevent um, direct contact between uh, those layers. So if we get too hot, a number of things can happen. If you get a battery very hot, that organic solvent can create um, little local regions where, where that increased temperature will result in vapor pressure, which can even separate layers. And so if you operate a, a lithium cell at high temperatures for, for long periods of time, you'll notice a more rapid degradation. And that de degradation is happening for these uh, in many, for different reasons, but for one reason um, is the delamination. So local sections of delamination, you're also getting breakdown of, of the solvent itself, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and so there are a lot of reasons why you don't want to be operating at too high of a temperature. But then you have the same problems on too low of a temperature as well. If you get too low, you can't act, you can't do charging cycles very well um, without causing damage in the battery. 
Um, so really kind of the optimal temperature range for, for operating a, a lithium battery is between 30 and 40 uh, uh, Celsius. And that, that's where you'll get the most performance. Um, you get a little bit extra capacity there. You get too hot though, and then you end up causing problems to the battery. Thank you, Nathan. Great. Um, you know, where, where I'm at, uh, I'm up in uh, Arcata, California, um, right next to the ocean. Um, so we, we do have some high humidity. Um, sea salt spray has been a consideration. Um, and, and when we have environments that are have that corrosive sea salt spray, we want to think about keeping these batteries inside if your jurisdiction is going to allow it. Let's keep them in a garage. Let's keep them in a basement. We don't, we don't have basements here on the, the West Coast primarily, but uh, keep them in an area where we're really going to keep it out of that con condensing atmosphere, whether it's too hot or cold. Go ahead, Nathan. So, Daniel, I, I'd like to make a couple of comments on this, just so people have in their minds kind of a mechanism of, of, of what can happen in, in a very salty environment. So I, I have an older uh, Jaguar down here. I live about two miles from the coast. And um, my Jaguar has had issues with the clear coat um, on it. And my neighbor has told me, yeah, you have continuous issues when you're really close to the ocean uh, with, with paint, right? And, and with corrosion. And as Daniel said, that kind of humidity, especially when you're near the ocean. So I'm thinking of island communities here, installations in Hawaii or Puerto Rico or anywhere, you know, really close to the ocean. Um, as Daniel said, you really want to try to keep these batteries away from uh, direct exposure to, to especially uh, salty air. Humidity can, so what, what is the mechanism that you're having problems with? So all of these batteries have a vent on the top of them. And that vent, they're hermetically sealed, which means they're, they're hermetically sealed, which means they are um, sealed off and there's no kind of exchange or direct contact with air. However, that vent is there to prevent explosions. And, and so if that vent starts to corrode, it can ruin the, the seal on the battery and then you can have a loss of electrolyte um, through that that broken seal. So I've, I've noticed just in my own experience with kind of trying to salvage uh, old lithium cells is that if they start getting rusty on the on the very top of those cells you end up having batteries that have almost no capacity and they're they're almost always ruined. So there are a number of things that you can do. As Daniel said, try to keep those batteries inside, whether it's inside even just a case. Um, and some people will even put desiccants, so desiccant packs or even rice packs inside of battery boxes to absorb that moisture and, and help prevent corrosion. That's um, great. But, but definitely keeping it out of direct exposure to the atmosphere is important, especially in, in salty humid conditions. Yeah, that's that's a great tip about the desiccant packs, and and it, thank you, Nathan. You know, it's it's easy for me to come on the on here and say, oh, don't put them in humid or don't put them in cold or wet um, or hot, but to have you, Nathan, explain the mechanism of failure and why um, on a, on a the. the the um, physics or the chemistry level is so powerful because we're not just, you know, don't put it next to the ocean, but to understand those details and the why is, is so powerful. Thank you uh, for, for helping uh, chime in on that. Um, it, the next time when we do one of these, maybe we should uh, put in the chat who's at the highest altitude uh, and whoever's at the highest altitude. Well, uh, let's go ahead and throw it in right now. <laughs> so it looks like, I mean, I had to, I think it was, apt that your that your callers gave me both uh, Celsius and Fahrenheit temperatures so they had to do the conversion since we didn't bother to include them. Um, but I think we've got, uh, it looks like Saul had the lowest temperature and Jake Osley had the uh, highest temperature. Will you two both put in your locations for us? We wanna make sure I verify those. And then Daniel, let's go ahead and throw out, we'll do another hat for a high altitude here. So let's put in the altitudes. And whoever's um, house is located at the highest altitude, we'll, we'll, we'll send a hat to them as well. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe your shop um, or, or the area you serve. Yeah. Um, I know here um, in California, we have uh, the coastal ranges, but also the Sierra Nevadas. Um, and there's a, a lot of, I know Grass Valley, there's a great solar company out there. Um, but those, those 
you know, the foothills are at three or 4,000 feet, and it only goes up from there. Um, I did look up before we um, started this, this talk, I looked up what was the uh, the altitude, maximum altitude rating for our new Simplify Inverter? A new Simplify Inverter I mentioned um, is our, our new system, you know, totally vertically integrated with our batteries and our app. And I uh, got 4,000 meters was the highest altitude the inverter is rated for, which is around 13,000 feet. That's pretty high up. Uh, some of the, the mountain passes like Highway 80 through Donner, Donner Pass is, I believe around 8,000 or so feet. So um, when we talk Looks about- like Ben Allen is at 7,000 feet there in Flagstaff. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and um, um, that those those are common large communities at these these um, high, uh, high altitudes. And so uh, and not only understanding um, that um, there's altitude limitations, but also understanding that as you go up in elevation, uh, the temperature decreases at a, a, a certain rate. And so we just understand that when you are at those high, temp uh, high altitudes that uh, temperature considerations definitely need to be considered. Um, Nathan mentioned prismatic cells. So there's a couple different types of cells that are used in uh, lithium ion batteries. Chemistry, right? We use lithium iron phosphate uh, as opposed to a cobalt chemistry. So chemistry matters, but also a form factor. And we use those cylindrical cells, which I'm, I've always kind of imagined look like a double A, double A battery. Those have that metal case that's able to kind of withstand pressure differentials, whereas a pouch cell or prismatic cell isn't necessarily able to hold up against some of those pressure differences. Yeah, one of our one yeah. of our tech um, you know tech groups where we, we send it and exchange information internally, this question came up, and our, our battery cells don't actually have limitations on altitude. Our cells, um, the the vent that is in those cells, a fully functional vent, should be easily able to hold a full atmosphere of pressure differential, and and most most cells can hold approximately ten atmospheres worth of of internal pressure. So as Daniel mentioned, that form factor, these cylindrical steel cased um, cells um, can easily hold the pressure difference uh, because the, of, of just the natural structural ability of, of cylinders. Um, and that is not true for prismatic uh, cells um, and definitely not for pouch cells. Um, our inverter seems to have more limitations in terms of elevation. And I'm not sure why inverters are limited um, but our battery cells, as Daniel mentioned, the big, the big um, question here is what the temperature, because typically at very high altitudes, you get low, low temperatures. So we don't have any limitations in terms of our operational limit for altitude, but just make sure that that temperature is within the correct operating range. Yeah, great. Thank you, Nathan. Um, I've always been excited to see, and I see this a lot with uh, Victron pieces of equipment, is the popularity of these mobile uh, sprinter vans, these mobile um, uh, Dodge, if I don't get the, uh, the other one, the Ford Transits. People don't seem to go out and buy RVs anymore. They seem to go out and buy these expeditionary uh, sprinter vans and, and outfit them with really elaborate um, off-grid kind of power systems. Although in this picture, you see, a, you know, a very nice Airstream. I would, I would take that as well. Um, kind of, <laughs> kind of, and I know you have a, a, a sprinter van, right, uh, Nathan? And maybe you could talk yes, to I that do. here in a minute. Um, but And I've had that van in Flagstaff. Um, so, uh, Ben? <laughs> yeah, and, and what, what are we talking about here? We're talking about um, vibration, right? And so these batteries, uh, you know, you're, you're jostling down the road for thousands of miles. Um, so we, we've had great success with our batteries um, being used in some of these mobile applications. We have some, our 3.8 batteries um, are great. We do have a smaller 1.4 uh, which is a, uh, a 12 volt or a 24 volt. The, the larger Phi batteries are 24 or 48 volts. So if you got kind of a more of a 12 volt system, uh, the smaller 1.4 Phi batteries work great because they're a small, little bit more of a smaller form factor and you can fit them into little kind of more power um, kind of battery boxes and, and little tighter spaces that you tend to find in some of these uh, mobile applications. Uh, you know, one thing is I've talked a lot about how 
um, the cylindrical cell. Um, one of the things the cylindrical cell gives us is safety. Um, if it does have any sort of thermal event, a cylindrical cell with that metal casing and the way the vent operates is uh, much more um, less likely to cause an unmitigated thermal runaway event. Right? It's not going to start spreading to other adjacent cells, such as maybe you'd see in a pouch cell. So we have gone through a lot of numerous uh, third-party testings, and we hold a UL9540 uh, listing on our larger systems, integrated system, UL1973 on the battery module systems, and the UL1642 on the battery cell level. So in these UL listings, we have other talks where we talk about specifically the 9540A listing and the 9540 listing. Uh, we're not going to go too deep into it in this talk, but just understand that we're subjecting these batteries to a lot of um, extreme kind of uh, temperature charge, discharge rates that aren't normally seen in real life. Uh, and then we can then stamp our batteries so that you can, uh, as the installer, uh, as you as the homeowner know that you're getting something safe. Um, we've all um, kind of heard in the news about thermal events with lithium ion batteries. What you don't usually hear in the news is that those aren't a cylindrical lithium iron phosphate battery. Usually those are cobalt based batteries with pouch cells. So it does a disservice for, uh, to people using cylindrical cells, using uh, LFP technology to not call out that difference. Um, cylindrical cells are a little more expensive to manufacture. As Nathan had mentioned, we have to, uh, there's specialized manufacturing uh, processes where we coil up these, spool up these cells. Um, it costs more, but it gives you a better performance. Um, it gives you a longer cycle life. And really what it does is give you a really safer battery. So as we're starting to scale up these batteries to larger and larger systems, and imagine the future 10, 20 years from now when we have these energy storage systems in every other house in our communities, in our neighborhoods, um, safety is really paramount. and something that we've always uh, been founded on here at Simplify Power. Yeah, so, thanks, Daniel. And yeah. one of the things you mentioned was these mobile applications. And even though our batteries, we, we really don't have batteries coming back to tech support based on uh, vibration. It is a good idea when you're mounting batteries inside something like a Sprinter van or or um, or a mobile application like a food truck to just mount them on something that can absorb and take away some of that vibration being transmitted to the battery case, right? It helps reduce noise as well. And so, you know, mounting mounting your battery on piece on a you know small piece of foam um, can add some you know can remove those vibrations from being transmitted into the battery as well as dampen some sound. That's yeah. Thank you, Nathan. And, and I love these tips too that you're giving us because these tips pertain to every uh, lithium-ion battery, not just Simplify. Um, so the, I, we want to make these talks, of course, about uh, Simplify and and uh, what we do great. But these kind of things are stuff you learn um, in these talks. Uh, the other example I was going to use about that desiccant pack as well. Um, we hold um, the uh, DOT, Department of Transportation, has some requirements that when we either airship a battery or when we ship them uh, on LTL or, or freight, that we have to have these UN numbers. And you'll see these UN numbers usually um, printed on the outside of the box that knows that we have achieved the UN 38.3. And it's a test that they put this battery through. Essentially, they replicate what would happen in the cargo hold of an aircraft. So if we were to ship a battery in a unpressurized uh, cargo hold of an aircraft, what would happen, right? It would be very low pressure, which is simulating a very high altitude, 40,000 feet up. Um, we're kind of simulating the temperature cycles as that plane goes up. We just talked about temperature goes down as altitude goes up and then the plane comes back down. So what happens when we're rapidly uh, changing the temperature of the battery and vibration as well, where we're simulating that. Also shock, imagine if there's some sort of cargo handler where uh, we're dropping the battery. So we were able to pass some of these tests um, and show that the battery is you know, gonna maintain its integrity when it's being transported in an airplane. It also, uh, you know, 
short circuits it, right? We heat it up and then we short circuit it. And we want to make sure that the battery doesn't exceed a certain temperature or really it doesn't catch fire. And then we're able to pass that test. Overcharging it, never do any of these things, please, to your batteries in real life. Uh, we're, we're trying to replicate the worst case scenarios and just make sure that it's not going to catch fire in that cargo hold of the airplane and we're allowed to airship these uh i believe in the continental united states is that right nathan yes okay thank you yeah but the 38 the un 38.3 does allow for um transport internationally as well so we it depends on our batteries the the ones that we have un 38.3 for are our ABS cased um, 3.8 batteries, which can be made if if you have some if we have somebody who places a large order. Yeah, and and they need something quickly, and we can air freight it for you. Um, thank you, Nathan. Yeah, um, I'm not going to go too deep into this. I talked about it briefly. Uh, UL 1642 is the cell level um, UL safety stamp, where we put these cells through a lot of different kind of abnormal conditions that you wouldn't see in a normal situation, um, shock, vibration, short circuit. Uh, once we get UL certified uh, 1642 cells, we then take those cells, in our case, they're cylindrical lithium iron phosphate cells. We then build them into a, a battery module or a battery really. And we put the cells in, um, pa in little packs in series and parallel configurations to make up the battery voltage we need. We then replicate or repeat, I should say, those same tests that we had at the 1642 level. The Again, the impact humidity drop heating, if we're able to successfully pass that um, without any event, we move on to the UL 9540. There is part of that is that the U, and you've, you've heard this, uh, I mentioned here earlier, is that UL 9540A isn't actually a certification. UL 9540A, what that is, is a test where we take one of our battery uh, modules and internal to that battery module, we have the cells and we wrap some of those cells with heating wraps and we superheat those cells to the point where they go into a thermal runaway, which essentially is off gassing that vent that Nathan had mentioned earlier. And it continues to get so hot that we're able to get an adjacent non-heated cell to, to vent or to go into thermal runaway. And then we watch what happens. And in our case, uh, and we publish our 9540A test report on our website, we feel that sharing these test reports uh, creates visibility in the market and really helps to help uh, create better understanding of what these UL certifications are in the market. But what happens is, is not much, right? The, the batteries kind of peter out and they self-extinguish. So I think it's important yeah, to point out to everybody, Daniel, as you're saying, so in case anybody's attention might have drifted, this, this is not, <laughs> we basically are forcing our batteries. So part of this test is to force our batteries to catch on fire, right? And we do that with putting heating pads around the cells and making them catch on fire intentionally. And so what Daniel is describing is when, the, when we do this, when we force them to catch on fire, what happens? And Daniel, what happens? It, it self-extinguished. Yes, right. And that's, that's a big difference between a cobalt-based battery chemistry and, um, and our LFP battery chemistry, right? The lithium ferrophosphate battery chemistry will self-extinguish -extingu our batteries you know, are safe. And this is one of the reasons we're willing to publish these, these tests and other people, other industries don't or other um, companies don't. Yep. Yeah. And, and so when we do that test and then we get the results back, we use the results of those tests. In our example, not much happened, it's self-extinguished. So then we're able to create a, a 9540 report and put in our operating installation instructions that you don't need to have big distances between batteries. You don't need to have fire suppression systems. You don't need to have uh, deflagration or explosion radiuses. We're able to put our batteries right next to each other. 
Uh, we're able to put them into smaller cabinets. We're able to have them closer to your garage wall or have a lower ceiling or even have them inside of a garage at all because we know we've shown through our test that we were able to determine and evaluate the various safety mitigation strategies that had to be employed. In other people's uh, tests, their 9540A test, uh, it was discovered that there did need to maybe have separation between the batteries or certain clearances or uh, built-in fire extinguishers. So again, the UL listings, um, 9540, and then 9540A dictates in the 9540 what has to be called out. Um, we're wrapping up quickly. Um, we're going to leave a little bit of time for um uh, q and A. I I did want to mention, you know, Simplified Power is now part of Briggs & Stratton, which is really exciting. Being part of this larger um, uh, organization allows us to kind of leverage a lot of the tools that Briggs & Stratton had. One of them is the Power Academy. So if anybody wants to pull out their phone, I got the QR code right there on your screen. You can create a login for the Power Academy, and we have all of these trainings um, kind of at self-paced. So if you're not able to attend these live trainings, uh, you can get in there and take some of these self-paced trainings. There's a lot of generator training in there as well. And we're always working hard. Uh, I know Nathan has us working hard to create new content for some of these. Um, these in-person ones are always great. Uh, live virtual is also something that we can help you out with in the self-paced ones. This is kind of just a screenshot to show you how easy it is really to jump in there and create a, um, a, a login. And you don't need to be an installer really to do this. Here's some of the um, integration uh, with Solark, which is really exciting. Um, also some of the other battery um, integration ones. Another thing is that if anybody here is already installing our batteries, I would really invite you to be part of our, our Elite IQ installer program. What that is, is what we want to do is help promote you. So if you're installing our batteries, uh, send me an email. My email is going to pop up here in just a second for everybody looking for those NAPSEP credits. That's the email you're going to email me to with your full name so I can get you your credits. But if you're already installing, go ahead and... Um, mention that you want to be part of our IQ program. I'll put your company on the map. So if anybody comes to the Simplify Power uh, website, the store locator or installer locator, and they put in their address and you're in their area, you're going to get a call from that homeowner. If for whatever reason they call into our sales support uh, application engineers, they, the sales team can also look up through the same tool who's in that customer's area and we'll go ahead and refer you business. Um, we can send you a little cash back, $25. Uh, we're going to send you some, some swag as well. So that's so I want to mention something Thank you. else quickly, Daniel. And that's that um, we're working on a big promotion here for IQ installers when they install a new ESS system. So please stay tuned for that. Um, we have, there are a lot of reasons to, to get you signed up for the IQ program, um, but we're looking at some big promotions coming up. So stay tuned and contact Daniel. If you're not already, if you're installing our batteries or if you're installing our inverters and you're not already in our IQ program, uh, this is a good time to get signed up. And, like yeah, and if you, we're gonna yeah. have some big promotions coming through here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And if you are an IQ uh, installer already and you're on this training, stay tuned as well, because there's going to be some great opportunities, uh, yeah. a little teaser for that. So uh, thank you for everyone who is already an IQ installer. And if you're interested, join. So that's the email of uh, training at simplifypower.com. Uh, again, my name was Daniel Moyer. Uh, Nathan Heston was on the line with us providing uh, some of that great commentary. Thank you for Nathan for being here with us. And thank you all for being on the call with us. Um, do you want to maybe open up our Q and A now? Um, yeah, Nathan? I do, Daniel. And there, there were some. Um, so first off, uh, Jake Osley, uh, Saul uh, Parada or Peralta, and Ben Allen. Uh, please uh, send an email to training at simplifypower.com. That email's there on the on the screen in front of you. Uh, we'll get those prizes out to you. Um, but I left Ron Milney's question here um, in the Q and A. Uh, Daniel, you could go ahead and take it, or I could. He says, um, neighbor had three batteries in a shed, and that got down to an ambient temperature of 28 Fahrenheit during a cold snap in December. Would the internal temperature have dropped below 32 Fahrenheit? Uh, Daniel, you want me to answer this one? Yes, please. 
Sure. Um, so it really depends on the details, Rob. Um, so I can say it's unlikely that those internal battery temperatures would have would have gotten below 32 Fahrenheit. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. So one, you know, eliminating exposure to direct exposure to the sky eliminates a lot of cooling that happens at nighttime. So if you're in a climate that gets cool um, on, on a cold, clear night, you'll often see that you'll get frost forming on your windshield slash the top of your car at night. And that's due to effect, an effect called blue sky cooling. You're not getting um, kind of infrared heat heating up the top surface of your vehicle um, like, like you would on the sides uh, from trees, from the environment. Um, so that's one thing, having it in a shed helps prevent some of that cooling at nighttime. Additionally, batteries, when they're discharging and charging, uh, produce heat inside the cells themselves. Um, and so for this reason, if those batteries are being cycled um, or used at all, it's unlikely that their internal temperature will drop uh, to ambient temperature. And uh, furthermore, just a single cold snap of 28 Fahrenheit, the, the rate of cooling of the inside of a battery depends on the temperature difference between inside the battery and outside. So for all these reasons, I can say it's quite unlikely, um, but if, if, you know, if they sat in 28 degree Fahrenheit for a long, long time, then yes, those cells could potentially get lower. Um, and you know, the temperature of 32 Fahrenheit is not a, an exact temperature, right? I mean, that's a freezing point of water, but these are not, it, it's basically a guideline and these are not, um, they don't contain water inside them, right? Okay. So a long-winded answer there to say no, probably unlikely to cause any kind of damage to a battery if it just gets down to 28 Fahrenheit for a little bit ambient. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, when we have a car, uh, our car, you know, if we leave it parked out on the street, the windshield is frozen over. Yet if I park it under my car, my carport, um, we're not chiseling ice off in the morning due yeah. to that effect. Yep. Um, and so I've got... Uh, Good. Fernando has uh, replied with the email there. He said, um, please talk about damages to batteries below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Um, so I, if you don't mind, Daniel, I'll address this one in a chemistry please. perspective. Okay. So inside, inside the batteries, as I mentioned before, you, you, you have two layers. One is called the cathode and the other is called the anode. And the cathode is aluminum um, and it's coated in our cases with lithium ferrophosphate. Um, it's a spray cast solution. On the other side, you have the anode, and that is a, a foil of copper, and that's coated with a spray cast solution of graphite. Um, and then in between those two layers, you have the electrolyte gel, and that electrolyte gel is what allows the lithium to move from one side to the other, and there's a porous separator in there as well. So if you get really cold, what can happen is that the percolation of the um, or intercalation of the lithium into the graphite layers slows down drastically. So on the charging side, it's very bad to charge lithium battery cells. This is, this is true for all lithium battery cells um, at very cold temperatures. So below 32 Fahrenheit, which is what your question is. So what ends up happening is if you try to charge cells too quickly at low temperatures like this, the lithium ends up kind of getting built up and stuck outside of the graphite. And you end up getting solid layers of a lithium that form. And these eventually form branches that, that are called dendrites. And these branches can actually penetrate the separator layer and make contact between the anode and the cathode. So it's kind of like, I've told Daniel, it's kind of like the growth of icicles um, or lithium crystals inside the cells. And that's what's happening there. Um, and the more you try charging batteries at low temperatures, the more damage can occur that can even eventually, um, you know, cause the battery to fail. So that's, that's the big reason internally why we don't want these ch cells charging below, you know, in, in, in really cold temperatures. And there's, as Daniel pointed out, there are some solutions for that. We can use we can use heating pads to, to make sure that the batteries themselves, the metal cases on the batteries don't get as cold. Um, we can keep them inside battery boxes and we sell um, you know, our BOSS 6, our BOSS 12 battery cabinets. 
You can even insulate the walls of the battery cabinets. There's enough room to do that. Um, the shelves, so you can put a thin layer of foam under the batteries that sit on the shelves and you can insulate the walls of these boss cabinets for additional temperature protection. Um, so uh, Eric asks, can you describe the full cycle efficiency drop charge and discharge as temperature approaches your limiting temperatures? I, I think that that's, um, <laughs> I don't have specific numbers for you, Eric, on this. Um, and I don't even think our engineering department has, has released any kind of format like that. Um, but basically the, you get lower efficiencies at lower temperatures, but at ex, you know, higher, highly elevated temperatures with the lithium iron phosphate cells, um, you have more potential for damage due to, to local overheating and um, separation of layers. Um, so I, I can't give you more than that, but if you Google search this a little bit, um, you'll find a number of publications that, that can describe this for you. And if you want to email me, training at simplifiedpower.com, I'd be happy to get back with you um, with some resources that you could read. Rob asks, um, uh, I think he was asking, I'm not sure quite what Rob is asking. He, he says, were you just referring to the location of a temperature probe being used to control the heating pads being kept outside of the pad itself? Um, so Rob, our batteries that are used with heating pads actually have internal temperature probes and they have temperature control built in. These are special order batteries from us, but we do have that ability um, to build out the batteries for low temperature environments by having built in, in heating control for the heating pads that we sell. So I'm not sure if I answered your question. If not, please further clarify. And it looks like, Daniel, there might be uh, some- I, I see one off. more, uh, is dust, uh, Eric asks, is dust a concern when operating a battery, battery energy storage system? I, I would say that no, not really. Right, um, unless there was enough dust to build up on the internal components um, of the BMS, right? Yeah, so then I, you could yeah. end up with overheating issues. I could but see maybe affects. with a, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Daniel. Uh, I was gonna say, what about the inverter? Um, I could see something with dust on that part side of it. Yes, if exactly, right. So the, the if, if you have enough dust, that you, the inverter is active heating and cooling, right? Or active heating. Um, Sorry, active cooling to control heat <laughs> with the yeah. fans. So there's three different fans that um, for an ESS system. So I was thinking specifically for the batteries, it's not yeah. a big concern for dust. But yes, for the inverter with all electronics, right? If you have too much dust, it can build up on the internal components. The fan can suck it into the um, into the housing and then blow it out. Um, so you know. Dust is a consideration. So if you're in an extremely dusty environment, you might uh, consider um, trying to prevent the inverter from, from having dust directly land in it, landing on it or sucked into um, the fans. Um, and that's the same for computers, right? I have torn apart computers years ago where, where dust had built up on the, on the board and on the, the um, uh, 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 fins of the yeah. heat sinks right and, yeah and that's causing overheating issues yeah no thank you that's a great question um well is i think that is it nathan um eric again, asks one more question that i'm not ahead. even familiar with the acronym here but eric asks is just a, a concern when operating bees a b battery BES systems yeah battery energy source system oh okay so i yes <laughs> that that was it yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, everyone, for putting in their temperatures and their altitudes. It's great to see that. Um, we do have um, pre-recorded ones on our YouTube channel as well. And check out our Power Academy. Uh, if anyone's looking for NAPSEP, training at simplifiedpower.com. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thank yes, you, Nathan. So when you're looking for those NAPSEP credits, please make sure to indicate the way your name should appear on your NAPSEP certificate. So send us an email with your name as you would like it to appear on the NAPSEP certificate, and we'll get those issued to you. Yeah, thank sometimes you, they won't. Yeah, they won't do it. Thank you, Nathan, for all your great input, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. Bye, everyone. Thank you.